Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so glad to have you and to be discussing this incredible topic here. So uh, I am Amy Regan from Full Script Emerson and I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Um, we will be having um, a, a discussion with Susan Hirsch and Corey Schuler. And if anybody has any questions, please pop them into the question box at um, in the in the chat area. So it is my pleasure to introduce Susan Hirsch, who is the formulation manager for Gaia Herbs. She is passionate about exploring the intersection between traditional herbal wisdom across all cultures and modern herbal research. She received her Master of Science in Herbal Medicine from Maryland University of Integrative Health and practiced in Maryland as a certified nutrition specialist and clinical herbalist. She originally spent several years at Gaia as a product information specialist, which gave her a strong foundation in understanding the uniqueness of Gaia herb products and recognition of the importance of consumer feedback and education. Susan believes in the profound wisdom of the body and the ability of food and herbs to connect to that wisdom. Her theory is that all plants help us by reminding us of our connection to something greater than ourselves, a view that aligns with Gaia's mission, values, mission and values. She was personally inspired to become an herbalist while standing in an amazing Gaia Herbs echinacea field many years ago and is extremely happy to be able to continue a relationship with these beautiful fields and products derived from them that have helped so many people. We also have with us today, Corey B. Schuler, who serves as the Director of Medical Science and Product Innovation for Gaia Pro. He is a family nurse practitioner, certified nutrition specialist, nutrition support clinician, and licensed nutritionist. He received his chiropractic doctorate from Northwestern University, uh, Northwestern Health Sciences University, a Master of Science in Human Nutrition from the University of Bridgeport, and a Master of Science in Nursing at Graceland University. He is currently pursuing a PhD in Health Sciences. He has additionally earned an Executive Master of Business Administration and an undergraduate degrees in Chemistry and Nursing. Schuler authored a chapter in the textbook Integrative Medicine, Integrative Medical Nutrition Therapy from 2020 and served as a peer reviewed articles. Schuler practices holistic primary care at Synergy Family Physicians in Bear Lake, Minnesota. So without further ado, welcome Corey and Susan. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Well, let's uh, let's get kicked off and, and get rolling. Um, so if you're here, you probably either have an interest or some questions about uh, the title of our presentation. So I just wanted to start off, and, and this is the educator in me, um, I want to start off with some goals. A presentation certainly has several goals, um, if nothing else. So if nothing else, um, hopefully you'll just leave this conversation with an appreciation of what your choices and your interventions and recommendations may do to influence the future generations of integrative health care, patient care, planetary stewardship, and better questions to ask your suppliers when you're uh, purchasing products. So so nothing big, but if the, you leave with just that, then that's okay. Um, I, the, uh, the knowledge here about, or the, kind of the nomenclature of future always interests me, right? Um, I'm not necessarily a healthcare futurist, but uh, but I play one on TV, um, the future of integrative healthcare. Well, what do I really mean by that? If our generation, this is going to get heavy fast, so we're going to try to add some levity as we can, but um, if integrative healthcare providers do not add a different degree of value and deeper knowledge to the recommendations we provide, uh, future practitioners of integrative medicine will likely face some of the same pitfalls that are our conventional medical providers, and, and you might be conventionally trained as well, and you may have left that system because of this. Um, you know, we're facing things like burnout, being outpaced by technology. We're essentially becoming uh, vending machines, and we don't want to be vending machines for green medicine. You know, uh, a green clinic coat, which I wish I kind of have now that I say it, a green clinic coat or, or dispensing herbs rather than medications doesn't protect us against these factors, but other things can protect us against these factors. So what I really want us to leave with, and it's a little bit of a, 
provocative ideas that the choices that we make today will determine if we have healthy people and healthy planet for the next generation and potentially the future of integrative healthcare. So why do people get chronically sick? Why do you think they get chronically sick? We know why they get acutely sick, but there's a lot of chronic illness going around. And I believe that it has a lot to do with isolation and lack of community. You might be nodding and thinking about mental health when I talk about isolation and lack of community, but I'm suggesting that this is the root cause of most chronic, chronic illness. And I'll expand more on this throughout the presentation. Uh, I'll give you a little hint. It has to do with the community of microbes. So here's another question. Do you believe that your natural product recommendations may have a greater impact than simply the improvement of health for the person in front of you? I hope you do if you're listening to this webinar. So choosing herbs for supportive health reconnects you to the community by nourishing your microbiome community within your body and choosing sustainably harvested herbs reconnects people to the community of the world in which you are, are a part of. This connection and this recognition of that connection is more powerful than you think. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, with these kind of provocative ideas, I think the question becomes, what do patients really expect from you outside of the diagnosis and treatment or assessment and recommendations? Uh, well, patients are seeking and are knowledgeable about things like regenerative and organic agriculture. And uh, at least um, I don't want to project here. I don't want to be caught off guard with them knowing more about that than me when I'm supposed to be this you know, doctor community and uh, being knowledgeable about things just outside of the diagnosis and treatment. So um, if they're going to be asking those questions, they might expect you to have similar or even advanced knowledge. Um, the benefit here, of course, is increased credibility, which I like and I hope you do, too. What would it be like to think about systems biology or functional medicine as an analogy to planetary health? The modern integrative practitioner, the traditional herbalist, and the regenerative farmer may have a lot more in common than you think. It's not just about the yield, like in conventional farming, farming but rather in the improvement of all aspects of the health of the soil. In systems biology, Greater complexity leads to positive redundancy and enhancement of healthy systems, which creates a positive regenerative feedback loop and leads to better health of the overall system. Integrative medicine and traditional herbal practice rarely targets just a single symptom, but thinks through how these systems are connecting together, thinking through quality over quantity and creating healthy relationships. People who work with regenerative and sustainable agriculture think like functional medicine and integrative medicine practitioners and herbal traditions. This is not new stuff. They know that healthy soil equals healthy plants. And we know that a healthy microbiome equals healthy people. Hmm, might there be a connection between healthy plants and a healthy microbiome that creates healthy people? I think so. So then we come to is organic enough? And I'd like to introduce a concept that we'll be talking about throughout the presentation that I learned in herbal school, and it has to do with compensation versus enhancement. It's basically short-term results versus long-term results. And it may seem like a simple black and white thing, but you can do both compensation and getting short-term results is sometimes necessary. You don't want the patient to suffer and you want to get them back to a state of comfort. But don't forget enhancement of the long-term function and sustainability of, of their health because the imbalance will create new symptoms if not addressed. Some plants can be powerful and compensatory and we use them for short-term use like poke or lobelia, um, but we only use short term because they can over taken too long. Um, most plants are generally more enhancing to long-term function and they do a little bit of both. 
Um, and as the person becomes healthier, you want to lean more on the enhancing side because you're working with the vital force. And that could include adaptogens, nervines, tonics, uh, supporting the microbiome, using more food-like herbs. This is how people have co-evolved with, with plants. So um, once you present them to their physiology, that'll just take over and you'll be creating health every day. So according to this concept, as a practitioner, every organic plant that you use in practice, you are compensating for the effects that conventional agriculture has on the environment. If you take this and apply it to planetary, planetary health, um, simply by omitting the chemicals in the supply chain that are detrimental, and that is great. And if you use regeneratively and sustainably grown plants, you are enhancing the whole environment and supporting the people stewarding that model, and you're enhancing the current and future health of people on the planet. So that's a much bigger effect when you <coughs> use the, the further, the regenerative and the sustainable options. Yeah, and this is the um, uh, this is this presentation, and the way we're doing it is different than we might do other presentations, right? We're still on the first slide. Um, we promise to get to the, some of the meat. It's super interesting, but we want to be sure we're set up for success, and you kind of understand our 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 position and where we're coming from. Because I, I mentioned earlier, like, hey, you know, do you feel like you're getting outpaced by technology? So another question is, do you ever kind of feel like some of what you do could be replaced by an app? Um, and then just not needing the integrative healthcare practitioner. Well, I mean, that kind of thing is um, important and, and relevant because we have to maintain our relevance to the patient. Um, I don't want to be replaced by an app. You don't want to be replaced by an app. Maybe some of the, maybe if an app could take notes for me, that would be great. Um, but point is, is that I want to be included in that relationship. I want them to be able to rely on me when they need me. And so um, improving our knowledge around uh, where things come from and how to improve the uh, the planet as well as the, the person's health, I think are, are vital information that maybe won't be as relevant to um, be replaced by technology. And the last point I would love for everyone to leave here with today is that human health is deeply intertwined with the health of the planet. And the degradation of natural systems that we are seeing now can have negative impacts on human health. However, there is hope it's possible to create a regenerative loop by supporting sustainably grown food and botanicals. And our window of time to do this is running out. So it sounds like we are um, maybe pursuing a position or maybe pursuing a, a policy and that sort of thing. And actually, that's not the case. Um, Gaia Herbs, Gaia Herbs Pro, Susan, Corey, we're not necessarily recommending any particular policy stance or opinion. Um, we believe that the commercial market really does drive the future but there needs to be options. If there's not an option to choose regenerative and organic and sustainable, um, well, then nobody has the opportunity to choose it. Uh, we wanna make clear choices for you, for your patients and the planet. And uh, there is a, a book, it's now a 30 year old book. It's called Ishmael. If you wanna pick it up, it's a quick read. I think I read it in a, in a day and a half, um, but it's by Daniel Quinn. And he makes this really great case. And it's it's very interesting because it's a, it's a gorilla teaching a human um, about history. Very cool book. Uh, but the one of the big take home points is that uh, that Ishmael makes is or creates the environment to make is that uh, we'd be better off as a planet and, and future species, in fact, to be levers and not takers. So you'll hear me or us talk about being a lever and not just a taker. Um, and I think that's fairly critical. So with that said, let's uh, let's move on and give you a little bit of background uh, to to us. Um, there's some cute stuff, right? I said there'd be some some levity here, and so let's uh, let's get into that. Um, I want to uh, have this kind of silly disclosure, right? Um, the the first one is relevant. Yep, we're we're employees of Gaia Pro, um, but 
both presenters are humans and inhabitants of earth, I think is kind of fun. But when I think about disclosures, disclosures, really the definition or the basis behind it is transparency about your bias. Well, we're biased. <laughs> we're biased that uh, this, this life sustaining, um, marble that floats through the, the, the world is maybe not designed exclusively for us. It's, uh, it's designed for everything on it and it's a part of us. Um, so you see a couple pictures here and, uh, the one on the far left is actually where I grew up. That's my hometown farm. Um, we, uh, we farm 2,800 acres of conventional, um, primarily corn and soybeans and, and some wheat. And so uh, for the first 17 years of my life, I, I worked the fields and um, did my part on the family farm. And it's a multi-generational farm. And uh, every time I walk in, so my first 17 years of life, every time I walk into the house, I would see that picture in the middle of two little boys. And I've been asked many times now, is, is that a picture of me? No, but I wish I was. There'd be some royalties there, I think. Um, you've been farming long. Um, because the, the farms of that time that were conventional still had this strong emphasis on stewardship that the land, while we pay taxes on it and, and, you know, we purchased, it really doesn't belong to us because we literally have to take care of it for our offspring, our next generation, or if we have to, if somebody else takes hold of it, that soil is going to be incredibly important for the next generation. So even though it was a conventional farm, this was before things like, uh, genetic modification. In fact, genetic modification started coming into play, especially the corn and soybeans in the early nineties. And so get this, I, um, I traveled with my father to a little town, 20 miles down the road, uh, Olivia, Minnesota and Olivia, Minnesota was the home of Kelchin seed corn and Kelchin seed corn gave this big, had this big theater. And we saw this presentation that was a whole lot like Jurassic park. It like showed us how they used, uh, the different virons to uh, to change the genetic structure, and it actually came around about the same time as Jurassic Park. So interesting, and a couple of different methods there. Um, but it gave farmers of that time a very precarious choice. There wasn't a separate market for conventionally grown, um, or I'll say, because conventional at the time was you grow and, and hope for the best. There wasn't a different market for that as compared to what they were suggesting for genetically modified organisms. So it's like, holy cow, you can spray these crops and the crops won't die, um, but it'll kill everything else so that the crops can uptake all the nutrients that all those weeds and other things could uh, take. And so uh, at the time, uh, yields were something like 50 to 60 bushels per acre. That was pretty good. And in the test plots, they were finding that genetic modification and being able to, to spray these crops was three times that, 150 bushels per acre for corn. And so if the neighbor down the street is getting 150 bushels per acre and I'm making 50 bushels per acre, um, I'm at a, you know, a third of the income because there's not two different markets. And so there was a really difficult decision that a lot of um, farmers had to make. And of course, we now know most of them decided to go with the genetic modification route because it was just, it was a stupid not to for them. They, they kind of had to. Of course, some of them had concerns, my father being one of them. Interestingly enough, um, my father only farmed for about six more years after that. Um, and in that time, he uh, was diagnosed with cancer twice. He was, um, he had, so he had a kidney removed, some other health challenges that I won't go into. But the fact is, is that six years of basically swimming in some of these extensive herbicides caused some really detrimental and impactful things for me. Um, and then more on the, the levity side of things, right about the same time, I had joined this uh, organization called Cure, which is funny now that I think about it, just clean up our river environment. Um, because I figured if we had we had to steward the land and we had to steward the soil. We also had to steward the water. Um, at the time I actually created like a little poem and I had to present it in front of, you know, hundreds of different people in a couple of different formats. And so, um, I was all involved in this idea of stewardship from an early, early age. Um, and that's where I see convergence and farming really coming together. So I'll share a little bit about my story and how I got to this conversation. It's been, a long time coming and I've been thinking about this for 
um, the last 20, 25 years. So I first started in college studying permaculture design and art and um, environmental studies. And at that time, after that time, um, after I graduated, then I found Gaia, um, stood in the amazing echinacea field and fell in love with herbalism. Um, then I started studying herbalism and physiology and discovered that they're really similar to permaculture design. Um, there's the same patterns that come up and you have to connect all the relationships and make sure everything is, you know, one um, thing waste is another thing's food and um, how they all interact. And also in that, that food is medicine. So as I learned about the human body and how plants interact with it, I discovered parallels between the ecosystems in the body and the ecosystems in the planet patterns of health and imbalance between both. And then I discover that our bodies are a community of cells with patterns of interaction, human and bacterial. And the planet is also the same, including plants and animals. As an artist, I was always fascinated by fractals in which the micro is reflected in the macro or the macros in the micro, who knows which started first. So who are we to think that our bodies are not a microplanet for trillions of bacterial cells? These are the things that keep me up at night. So when you think of fractals, think about these parallels. The Amazon rainforest is the lungs of the earth. The soil is the GI tract of the earth. The ocean is the water. The rocks and stones are bones. This is not just a thought experiment. Our life actually depends on keeping the ocean flowing in our tissues because we evolved from the ocean. We can't live with, without enough salt and iodine and potassium in our body to keep the blood flowing. So fast forward to having kids, I have a five-year-old son whose favorite book is called We Are Stardust. And it's a series of amazing facts about the human body using nature to explain and really cool pictures too. You should check it out. His favorite quote from that book is, inside your brain, electricity stronger than lightning powers your every thought. As a five-year-old, he's obsessed with lightning. So that was like super cool to think there was lightning in your brain. And now he goes around asking all the smartest adults he knows if they know that they are born from stardust. <laughs> he went to the doctor and asked that the other day and the doctor was like, huh? <laughs> I think it's not a coincidence that I work now at a place called Gaia, whose mission is to connect people and plants to create healing. And there's also a Gaia hypothesis stating that the earth is a living being. This was created in the 1970s by James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, and named after the Greek goddess Gaia, who personified the earth in ancient Greek mythology. It proposes that living organisms interact with their inorganic surroundings to perform a synergistic and self-regulating complex system that helps to maintain and perpetuate the conditions for life on all planets and that organisms co-evolve with their environment. We're all on the ship together in a great big messy community and this means we are connected to every little living thing on earth. Remembering that is healing in and of itself. So to hold the name Gaia is to hold a great responsibility for the earth. And in part because of that, but partly because it's the right thing to do, we also have a regeneratively organically certified farm where we grow some of the herbs that we use on our supplements and others that we can't grow. We place a lot of emphasis on sourcing from sustainably harvested farms or ecologically wildcrafted sources. And so the uh, the picture on your far reading right is probably the most common picture taken uh, at the Gaia farm. And this is right in front of the farmhouse onto some of the fields. It probably is like, a, I don't know, a, a sixth of the fields. Uh, you can't get to see them all because they kind of stretch around to the left. And if you ever get a chance, um, it'd be great to, uh, to visit the farm. But uh, you'll probably take this picture, too, because everybody seems to. All right. So next is uh, just some of the standards that, that we're working with. And this is a, a little bit of our commercial, but also a little bit of our um, the things that I think are relevant here. Um, you know, 
because planetary and human health are interconnected and the earth is a living being and humans are just a, a part of it amongst all the other species, we have this really huge responsibility to treat our bodies responsibly as well as treat the planet responsibility. So protecting planetary health is essential for human health. That's, that's the basis that we're, we're working from. And, uh, by reducing the impact on the environment, promoting sustainable practices, we can really help ensure a healthy planet for ourselves and future generations. And so looking at the slide itself, um, we see things like we use an ethical supply chain. So farm workers, um, their care and their, you know, compensation matters to us, even when we're working with partners to bring on the supply chain. Obviously we do that for our own farm workers as well. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we, just refuse to do is use harsh chemicals to extract any of our herbs. So we don't allow our suppliers to use the harsh chemicals and we don't use them ourselves. We're using water, ethanol, and CO2. We'll talk about solvents here a little bit later. Um, and then even uh, ethically sourced. So um, there's a variety of methods here. We, we don't harm any animals. There's no animal products. Um, if the animal is harmed, like for example, we might use something like sheep's wool lanolin for a vitamin D product, but the animal doesn't, uh, isn't injured or killed during that process. Um, and then we're, yeah, we're always prioritizing organic and non-GMO. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences between organic and, uh, and regenerative here uh, coming up. So um, this is a, a little bit of an unfortunate circumstance. We had this really great picture of our director of operations, Dr. Tim Murray, um, and, uh, and Kate Renner, our manager of uh, farm operations um, that, uh, that didn't uh, get included here, but this is a, a similar-ish picture. So any, at any rate, um, I, I guess I have some more provocative ideas, things to, to talk through. And uh, to some of the questions that are being asked in the Q&A or the chat, uh, we'll get to those. Um, there's some really good questions in there. And so hang tight, we're going to get there for sure. But so here's my provocation. If you were, uh, if you, the practitioner could go back a few decades and tell your colleagues of that time. So let's say go back to the eighties, go back to the nineties, um, about all the problems that we're dealing with, um, from a, either a health perspective, like, Hey, I'm seeing a lot of this. Could, could you all do something different? in your practices to help me out here? Or, hey, what about all the challenges that we're seeing in the environment today? Could we could we do some things to, to speak a little louder about those things? Um, what would you tell them? Like, really think about what would you do if you could jump into your DeLorean and go back 30, 40 years? Um, you know, for example, there's medicinal uses of mercury. Further back than 30, 40 years ago, that was really common. But now we're learning, especially with some of the um, some of the interest in genomics and epigenetics that there's generational consequences uh, due to these epigenetic and even genetic changes. So what would you say? What would you do to go back um, if you had that chance? I think it's it's a common question that I find myself asking. The other one is that uh, we talk about nutritional quality of food, right? We we compare ultra processed foods to um, to minimally processed foods all the time. At least I do in my practice. I'm sure you do too. But the reality is, is that if regenerative farming or, or minimally processed foods are this higher quality of food, well, that goes the same for botanical supplements as well. Um, so let's not forget that how the, how it's farmed is actually really relevant. Greater processing comes with lower quality lower density constituents, the lower density causes more processing because you have to concentrate it at a different rate to get to the active constituents that you're looking for. It's this feed forward cycle that we can avoid by simply just greater farming practices. So building healthy soils, reducing the use of synthetic chemicals, that's good. Regenerative farmers can produce crops that are more nutrient dense or active constituent dense and also free of those harmful residues. So this can improve not just the quality of the products that we're consuming and recommending, but also reduce the risks of chronic disease. So to think about it this way, plants develop active constituents based on the environmental stressors. So things like the insect population or the herbivores that are around. Um, if they grow up without stressors, if the plant grows up and is just not stressed, they're really not making um, 
those important medicinal components, or at least not at the concentrations that we need them at. Um, I liken this to uh, an astronaut in space. Um, I, I spent a, a little bit of time working at NASA and I, a, enough to know that there's these significant health consequences that astronauts face. One is bone health and one is immune system. They see really the without the stressor of gravity, bone health is not built, right? Wolf's law. Um, we're also paying attention to if they're in this antiseptic environment of the, the shuttle or the space station, uh, they're not their body's not required to fight off these common microbes. And so their immune system gets suppressed and you can look those, that information up. It's, it's widely available. So environmental health, uh, I think we're all feeling this right now. Who has suffered from wildfire smoke or flooding or extreme heat waves um, and that's impacted their health lately? I think probably we're all everywhere all over the country and i'm sure somebody has something to say about that regenerative agriculture actually can improve the health of the environment which can have positive health impacts on human health um, and it, it does this by reducing soil erosion nutrient runoff and omitting the use of synthetic chemicals um, and also just stewarding the soil the soil has an amazing carbon capturing capacity and if you support that, it will do it for you. So it, it seems like so simple that um, too easy, but it's, it's what we need to do on a massive scale. Uh, we need to focus on the soil quality, soil health. Um, and this goes over to antibiotic resistance as well. Because of the way that we've had our industrial practices, antibiotics in agriculture has led to antibiotic resistant bacteria, which does pose a significant threat to human health. There's even antibiotic stewardship programs based on this. But regenerative practices like rotational grazing and integrated pest management, reducing the chemicals, also having healthy soil for the, for the animals to eat, that can all reduce or eliminate the need for antibiotics. There's a lot of cool science happening in that area. And then social and economic, economic sustainability. This is gonna be a huge issue as our environment is affected, people's health, public health is affected, people's way of life that um, we've, we've made in the industrial agriculture system is falling away because it's not viable anymore. So we need to create a new system and regenerative agriculture also addresses social and economic sustainability. Um, regenerative farmers can create more resilient and equitable food system that supports the health and well-being of all members of the community. There's some horrible things going out there with toco and um, child slave labor and palm monocrop plantations and some of the social um, devastation that's happening there. And not to mention destroying an entire rainforest for a monocrop. Without the rainforest, Earth cannot survive. Remember, that's that's our lungs. So we've got to find out a better way to deal with this. And um, one of the ways that I like to think of is from our traditional martial arts um, traditions. If you think about Ikido, it's a way of working with the energy of the vital force or whatever you call it, the force um, from Star Wars, you work with it instead of fighting against it. And then it's much easier. All right. Good technology is working in our favor. Great. Um, so one of the things that I comment on, and you can see at the bottom of this slide on the far left, um, you know, over the decade, we, the concept of complex uh, patient has really not only been used more widely in multidisciplinary healthcare teams, but also um, different disciplines and has kind of, uh, there's a variety of names that we associate with this, right? Uh, multimorbidity, polypathology. Um, this is a, a thing that we wrestle with on a daily basis. And it spans across all sorts of, 
all different types of our friends, right? Even social workers and um, other folks are dealing with this, not just in medicine. Um, with that said, um, we have sort of some of the same things going on planetarily um, that I think Susan will, will spend some time on it. One of the things that I use as an example is that dramatic changes in complex systems or a complex patients are often not realized until a tipping point has been reached. And what I talk to patients about is the best example is kidney health, right? Our biochemical markers are very latent. Um, we often don't see the, uh, the change in creatinine clearance or uh, creatinine or uh, uh, blood urea nitrogen until there's a significant damage already done that can't be necessarily undone or difficult to undo. Uh, so that's some of what we're kind of worried about, I'll say with planetary health. So we're going to have a little exercise where we look at the planet as a person and assess the health of the planet. The planetary health refers to the state of the natural systems that support human health and all life, such as air, water, and soil. And if you remember this, uh, this statement, I'm going to keep saying throughout the presentation that human health is deeply intertwined with the health of the planet. And if you degrade these natural systems, that can have negative impacts on human health. So is the planet getting sicker is really the wrong question because actually Earth will heal, but we might now be able to live on it. It will become less hospitable and much, much harder to live on this planet. And um, we're getting sicker as we try to adjust. So learn to live according to the natural rules or don't live at all is the message there. Um, pretty drastic. So climate change. Uh, we're living this right now. I, every time you turn on the radio, you hear about the horrible floods in Vermont or the horrible um, air uh, heat waves that are going across the world. And then you see sea, rising sea levels and extreme weather events. These are all the signs that the planet is getting sicker or the systems are getting more imbalanced. And this is all due to human activity, burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and other human activities, extraction activities. So climate change will, will have and does have direct and indirect impacts on human health. Is there a parallel between climate change and menopause? Is the earth going through menopause? having hot flashes or is the earth having fevers because it's trying to shed something that's harming it? I'll just leave that for you to think about for a little bit um, and move on to biodiversity loss. Habitat destruction, overfishing, and invasive species has led to loss of biodiversity and many species are at risk of extinction and many species have already become extinct due to these human activities. And this can lead, this destruction of all the systems can lead to the emergence and spread of infectious diseases, which we are also living through right now. If you remember, well, one of the theories on COVID is that it was a bat virus and um, that was because the bats were displaced because of their habitat. And we may not know the whole truth ever, but um, it is something that is affecting us now. So if I were to look at the planet here, I would say this might, this looks like dysbiosis or maybe even celiac disease and over a total loss of biodiversity. So then pollution, air, water, and soil pollution are all more examples. And air pollution we know increases the risk of respiratory diseases, um, same with water and soil. We're seeing lots of impacts on human health. So if I were to look at that, I would say, is that liver toxicity or cirrhosis or just nasty, uh, fatty liver? Um, we don't know how bad it is yet. Deforestation, is that, if, if the Amazon rainforest is our lungs, is that the destruction of alveoli and COPD, plastic pollution, is that hormonal disruption or metabolic disease? 
this something interesting to think about as we think about the planet as a living being? Absolutely. And uh, I know we're running short on on the time we try to pack too much in as, as per usual, but uh, just a couple of rhetoricals like, hey, this this slide that you see here, does this question um, or quotation feel threatening to you? It's not really a question. We pay the doctor to make us better when we really should be paying the farmer to keep us healthy. Um, I see some crossover between the roles, right? Um, integrative medicine wants to keep people healthy, um, so it's not intended to be a uh, threatening, um, but your interactions with your patients to influence the community are extremely relevant and potentially more so than our, our conventional uh, colleagues uh, would take into consideration. So I'd ask that we really step into our power and have some healthy leverage of influence because what we say and do can really be impactful. Um, your patients might have questions about what kind of things are you doing uh, to excuse me, help with sustainability or your own practices. Um, so if you've put on the white coat, but never put on the work gloves, I think it's maybe time to get acquainted with how growers and ranchers uh, think and do things. Um, I can tell you from experience, it will change your perspective on how, um, how you treat patients. So I want to just quickly share a few models that I've seen that are working now that um, practitioners are doing now. I went to a regenerative healthcare conference at the Rodale Institute, who is one of the partners on the regenerative organic certification. And it was an amazing experience. We explored all these different models where practitioners could implement organic and regeneratively grown food into their practice. Um, we visited a local hospital farm that grows vegetables that are all prepared for the regional hospitals and was used as a CSA for its employees and patients. And since they implemented this program, they saw um, their, their patient health numbers improved and all everybody in the program, employees and patients, enjoyed a renewed quality of life. And since then, the hospital has become slightly famous and highly sought after. It's St. Luke's Hospital in Pennsylvania, if you're wondering. Um, one practitioner focused on access to healthy food in the community, and she created a whole network in schools, churches, and neighborhoods, all based on healthy food. And that included a veggie CSA that would deliver um, healthy food to a diverse group of people who weren't able to have access to healthy food normally. Um, and then there are several other examples. There, um, just amazing stories of a doctor transforming his practice into a farm CSA, and you had to have a mandatory prescription of vegetables if you want him to see you. Or a cardiologist that went and created a wellness center and incorporated nutritious and locally grown foods. So there's lots of examples of this, so it might not be mainstream yet, but the point is that uh, you can do this, and it starts just by connecting the dots, by meeting a few farmers, maybe meeting some other community people who are interested in this conversation. And you have more power than you think to create the change that you wanna see. Um, so, so, I was gonna say, we're, uh, we are, um, again, time is not in our favor. So one of the things that we're gonna do is let's just highlight the, the biggest things that are uh, of critical importance here. And um, I'm actually going to, let's see, I accidentally skipped a slide. Oh, the slide that I'm interested in is just in a different order. No worries. Um, this one is, uh, I'll say fairly critical and because it's something to be paying attention to in the future. Um, I've mentioned the difference between, or there is a difference between organic and regenerative, and this is part of the slide deck. So I will uh, leave it for you to read through. But essentially, there in, is there's the word regenerative is about to be co-opted. We're seeing it being um, used by big ag um, and in inappropriate ways. And so, when you're looking for things, look for both organic and regenerative, um, because I, I, like I said, there's there's some things that we're seeing in the background that are going to be changing for um, for the consumer. So the gist of it is um, you want to do regenerative and organic because uh, alone, they're not enough. And regenerative, just a regenerative farm could be really destructive to the soil. 
if they're saying that they don't till, but they spray glyphosate to kill everything, that's not focusing on healthy soil and that's destruction. Organic is compensation. It keeps poisons away. Um, some organic uses compost. So it's, it's great. There's nothing wrong with organic, but we can do more. The Regenerative Organic is a new certification by the Regenerative Organic Alliance. And it focuses on three pillars. Soil health is number one, animal welfare, and then social fairness. And the social fairness pillar is um, really important because it focuses on the health and support for farmers, their in living wages, um, and it builds all kinds of support for farmers, and we know that we need that support. So I also want to talk about something that's not on the slide, and it has to do a lot with botanicals because a lot of our botanicals are wild crafted. Um, and so there are a couple of certifications that do matter for botanical supplements. One is fair wild, and that means that your herbs that are sustainably wild crafted are done so ecologically. And this is important because it keeps intact ecosystems intact and the people who are stewards, who are responsible stewards of those ecosystems have a viable way of life. Um, so you can think of like conservation could be buying up tracts of land. It could also be purchasing botanicals that are uh, fair wild harvested because that supports a whole ecosystem. And then there's fair for life as well as another certification, and um, that also has a social focus. And usually Fair for Life in other countries also comes along with organic. Um, so we have a holy basil source that we, comes from a Fair for Life farm in India. And we could grow holy basil easily on our farm, but we chose this particular farm because they're Fair for Life, organic, and rock certified and the quality is great and so we feel really good supporting vulnerable farmers in India to grow a holy plant in a sustainable way. Um, and I don't want to miss pointing out the connection between healthy soil and healthy people because this is something that Rodale has been working on looking at the research and um, it's incredibly interesting. So they've been looking at long-term controlled research studies comparing the soil microbiomes of organic and conventional cropping systems, and they always see a difference in the community of bacteria. They see a difference in the resilience of the soil and the ability to hold water. Um, but what really excited me is they found that there's a certain focus that is crucial to be in the soil that helps to um, pull in carbon from the air. And then there's um, it's a mycorrhizal fungus that helps to uptake a compound called ergothionine. You may have come across this compound before um, if you study medicinal mushrooms because it's mostly most found in oyster mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms. But actually it's in the soil everywhere we look if we let it grow the way that it wants to grow. And so that means that it's in the food that we're eating, except we're not eating food that way. So this could be the missing link between um, healthy food and healthy soil and healthy people. It's ergothionine compound. Um, and it's very fascinating. I was just gonna tell you a few facts about it. So it, we all know about glutathione and its importance for cellular detoxification of um, and modulating inflammatory stress. So ergothionine is like a backup to glutathione for when you're really stressed out and you blow through all your glutathione. Um, it was first discovered in 19, 1909, but it wasn't until 2005 that they discovered a specific transporter on this in human tissue. And it was found that once the body absorbs all of it that it ever comes across. It absorbs it all, and it concentrates it in the kidneys, in the mitochondria, in the placenta, red blood cells, eyes, semen, and skin. These are the most sensitive tissues to inflammatory distress. And 
these are also, if you think about traditional foods, um, ki liver, kidney, it also concentrates in black beans and kidney beans and shiitake oyster mushroom. These are all kidney supportive, vital key foods that um, traditional people eat. So is this a mi missing link? There are already some papers out there that are demonstrating a link between an ergothionine deficiency and chronic disease. Um, so I think that's super exciting. And I think we need to double click on exploring this conversation because that could be a biomarker that we could measure in the soil to show that it's healthy soil. Yeah. And, and with that said, this is not a, um, this is not something that only guy is interested in, but I would say not enough supplement companies are interested in the material that we're talking about. And this is sort of an open invitation to any supplement companies or, or you, the practitioner, to, to ask and, and frankly demand that more sustainable practices, more regenerative practices, or at least organic practices are used for dietary supplements just for the health of um, the world, not just simply the, the patients. So because we are... Um, limited here on time. I wanted to skip through a couple of these. Um, there's, we had this uh, really interesting um, idea to connect microbiome health to soil health. I think that we will let you explore that too. We have other resources that we can share as well on it, kind of describing what is soil and what are herbs um, and that in continuing that combination. One of the things since we're talking about supplements is I wanted to show you um, just the, the versions of things that can occur. So the plant as itself has a, has a key role in the environment. Um, of course, in turmeric, we generally just use the, the rhizome. Uh, you don't see the, the rhizome here in the, the far left, but regardless, there's several ways of doing that. There's minimal processing where you just ground the turmeric and um, hope for the best. A lot of us are interested in curcumin or curcuminoid levels. Um, there's an option to use a uh, I'll say safer solvents, or we can use harsher solvents. We'll show a table here shortly on different solvents that are common amongst botanicals. And then you can kind of take it one step further and, and hyper-process it into a, a drug delivery system. As you can probably tell, um, Gaia Herbs is, is using just uh, non-harsh solvents um, rather than using the drug delivery systems or things like hexane. So, with that said, here are uh, some of the lists. So these are uh, problematic, <laughs> problematic herbs um, and solvent, not just solvent residues, but just the use of solvents. The one thing that we ran out of space here for was milk thistle. Uh, milk thistle uses both hexane and acetone. And interestingly enough, we're generally using that for liver health, but things like you'll see turmeric listed here twice because methanol is often used, hexane is used. It's a difficult, herb to extract oftentimes. And so in order to increase efficiency, like a taker would, um, we want to improve that efficiency, but then we have to do something with those wastes. So lots of challenges with the downstream waste systems. And I wanted to just show you some of those as well. Um, I did mention that we use CO2 as extraction. This is probably one of the more efficient things that we can do without having, um, excess waste into the environment. It is not without um, challenges though, because it does use a lot of energy to do it. Um, that's the trade-off that we, we get for that, but we can get a, a variety of different compounds. In fact, we can almost get full spectrum out of most herbs using CO2. So the question is, why don't we just use CO2? Well, if we can do it with ethanol and water, a combination thereof, that's even a better approach to it. So, um, I, I won't read you the waste streams of solvents, but it's here for your reference. Um, but this is going to make ultimately um, products a lot more costly if we continue to use them. So we have a strong opinion about not using them whenever possible. And then uh, a little bit more of a controversy. Um, there are, we care about residual solvents, right? We don't want our patients actually involving themselves with taking in residual solvents with their dietary supplements. And a lot of companies are actually pretty good about that, but they're still using them. One of the things that kind of popped up is that some of these solvents are actually 
not used as solvents, but they're actually um, created in, by the plant itself. So small amounts. So for example, in, in methanol, there are some plants that actually create small amounts of methanol or compounds that can be converted to methanol in the body. And so taking large amounts of them can be a little bit deleterious. We haven't run into this very often, but there, this is a paper from the American Botanical Society that illustrates that point. And with just a few minutes left, and I apologize that we didn't get into the details of all of it, I wanted to read some of the Q&As that, um, that we're going to be able to answer. Um, but there was a concern about adulteration of turmeric. Like that's just something that Gaia Herbs would never, we wouldn't add coloring to turmeric to make it more gold. Um, but there has been certain products that have um, been caught doing something like that. There's also things like spiking of, of curcuminoids where um, they'll add in additional curcuminoids created by harsh uh, solvents and add that to just a, a turmeric powder. So we have to be really careful about the adulteration. So good question on that. And um, I think with that, I wanted to kind of land the plane on it. And if we do have any other time, we can um, get some questions answered. So this is actually our, our last slide. And it's again, a little bit of a fun slide. It's a, again, heavy presentation, heavy topic, uh, lots of different ways to slice this, but this is a, just a couple of folks from our sales team. Um, you can see that we're not using the, you know, $10 million um, super heavy equipment. We're using uh, even tractors that are lighter and older, frankly, so that we're not damaging and compacting the soil. And so this is, they're really just replanting. We sort of had cultivated the, the seed into a, a fledgling plant and they're uh, actually planting them by hand there on one of our last meetings. So our, I mentioned, or Susan mentioned the farm that it's 350 acres. And I just wanted to give you a scope for that. If you happen to live in a city, this is 219 square city blocks. 219 square city blocks is, is not nothing. I wish it was a, a million, right? Uh, I wish it was all like that, but it's a, a fairly big uh, endeavor and it takes a lot of people doing a lot of hard work to keep it in balance and keep it regenerative. So um, actually, Susan, if you wanted, if there's any other pieces that you wanted to add, I think it would be great for you to, to land the plane since this is primarily your topic. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to help land the plane by saying, answering the question, why is regenerative, organic, and sustainable the future of botanical supplements? The answer is because we won't have a healthy future on earth if we don't embrace these practices. And so we've got to make more sustainable choices to support the vitality of people and planet um, because we're connected to every living thing and we are responsible for that, for the health of the planet. So with that, if there's any other questions or anything else in the, the chat that we haven't gotten to, we can take those. I know we're close on time. Yeah, if everyone, you know, can sort of stay for a couple more minutes, that's totally fine. If anyone has any additional questions, they want to pop in the chat. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, so the recording will be sent via email um, with a special offer from Gaia Herbs Pro. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who joined us today as we sort of wrap everything up and take a look at the uh, questions that are coming in. While we're doing that, there was a quote from the Daniel Quinn book, Ishmael, um, and he writes that the, the takers regard the world as a sort of human life support system, uh, as a machine designed to um, uh, produce and sustain human life. Um, but that puts us sort of at war with the planet. And so what happens if we win that war? What happens if we conquer the world? What happens if you win? Well, since you're a part of it, humans being a part of the world, we're essentially at war with ourselves. So the path, the new path of regenerative and organic, not necessarily new, just the, the reemergence of it is, uh, is critical to put, putting away that war with ourselves. So um, I say that's probably my last comment, but anything else that has come through? I'm not seeing any. Amy, are you seeing any? 
I think we were able to answer all the questions here. So uh, anybody who has any questions as they go along their day, they can email them over to me. My email address is Amy Regan, that's A-M-Y dot R-E-G-A-N at fullscript.com. And I will ask for help with Corey and Susan to uh, get those questions answered. And I just want to say thank you so much to everybody for their time today, to you, Corey, and to you, Susan, for this this presentation. And uh, excellent, everyone. Uh, Thank you again and enjoy your day.